At the beginning of the PowerPoint, I've got an example here of some of the variability that we see in a gene in Drosophila. It's an interesting gene, but uh, for, for our purposes, uh, it's not really that critical a point, so I'm going to skip over it. You'll, I think there's an item in the SLO. You can cross that out and not worry about it. It covers just the first two slides of the PowerPoint. But what I want to do is talk about and go over one big main example of quantitative trait loci, or QTL study. So these are incredibly useful studies that are even more important today as we are gathering more and more data, large databases, of, on the genomes of organisms. Uh, in particular, humans, but we're doing it with other organisms also. We're going to look at an example in the fish and I'll talk about how this type of study is incredibly useful for finding target genes. So before we define quantitative trait, remember we talked about the melanism uh, phenotype and how we knew ahead of time that it was the MC1R gene that we needed to look at. That was a good candidate gene and often a candidate gene approach is great if you know what genes to expect or maybe you've got three or four and you can have enough resources to look at all of them and hopefully you've gotten it right and you find some data, some evidence that the genes actually do have an impact on the phenotype you're interested in. But what if you have no idea what genes are controlling your specific trait? So this is a little bit trickier. However, with a careful analysis on a large data set, we can identify genes that contribute to phenotypes of interest, and it can be any phenotype. So we're going to talk specifically about a developmental trait in fish, but you could do it for Alzheimer's or uh, diabetes, any disease or any condition, doesn't even need to be a disease, any phenotype you're interested in that has a genetic component, you could use a QTL study to identify all of the contributing genetic factors for that um, trait of interest, okay? So to do this, let's define quantitative trait and talk about it a little bit. Now, quantitative trait, in my mind, I always thought continuous trait was a little bit of a better term, but quantitative trait works fine. So quantitative, sorry, quantitative trait is a trait that expresses a range of phenotypes and there are no discrete character states. Now, what does that mean, okay? So for instance, this one shows discrete ones with step-by-step, step, but in reality, with quantitative traits, we see much something much more like a normal distribution. So if we were to look at height in humans, it's definitely a quantitative trait. Most people are right around the average, right? Well, maybe not most, but that's where the, the largest number of individuals are at the average. And then it would drop down until we get to, you know, like four feet tall or seven feet tall, a little more, a little less than both of those. But that is a continuous trait. And whether or not you're tall, to some extent, depends on your frame of reference, right? So if I'm six foot two, if I walk out onto an NBA basketball court, I'm not going to look very tall. But I'm taller than average, okay? But I'm not... There's no, no such thing as tall, short, where do you draw the line? It's a gray air, gradation with everything in between. That's a quantitative trait. Now realize that many characteristics in organisms fall into this. So we could look at personality. Those are on a spectrum with everything in between. Height, like we just talked about. Uh, size. Coloration is often a, a continuous trait. Um, hair texture, right? Curly versus straight, but you can get everything in between. So many, many things, heart disease, Alzheimer's, fall on this quantitative trait. And even if it's not a completely normal distribution, and there might be some amount of um, various phenotypes, we can still use a QTL analysis to identify regions of the genome that contribute to the trait that we are interested in. So we'll talk about how we do that. Okay, so here's our definition. We talked about several examples. Now let's talk a little bit about the genetic mechanisms. Quantitative traits are complex. That's a, a simplification, but they're genetic underpinnings, the networks that uh, define and dictate what the phenotype is going to be, 
are very, very complicated. Almost always they are polygenic, meaning there are many genes. And sometimes there actually might be a dozen or more genes that all contribute to a particular trait. So for instance, if I was going to look at height in humans, there is not a tall gene. There are several genes that all play a role, and each of those genes maybe has multiple alleles. There may be epistatic interaction between those alleles. There might be codominance. There might be incomplete dominance. So it, it's going to be complicated. Um, now, the cool thing about a QTL study is it doesn't really matter what the genetic mechanism is. If there are several of them and they're all contributing to the range of phenotypes, we can identify areas of the genome that contain our gene of interest or maybe even our regulatory element of interest. So it can find, no matter what it is, it can find an address, if you will, the technical term is a locus, a location on a chromosome that is near a genetic element that causes the trait of interest. Okay, so these are quantitative trait loci, these regions that we identify that contribute to a trait of interest. So locus is the singular, loci is the plural. Okay, so I'm going to outline how a QTL analysis is performed. We'll look at the steps, and then we're going to look at one specific developmental example. But again, remember, you can use this for any genetic trait you're interested in. Often we're interested in you know, health-related ones or ones that are of particular interest for the field of study, but really we could do it for any trait that is genetically determined or partially genetically determined, okay? So here's what we did originally, and this is still done to some extent, although big data sets have largely taken the place of this first one. So I'm going to actually type that in. We'll modify it here as we go. But first off, what people did was they developed divergent lines for your trait of interest. So for instance, if you're looking at coloration in fruit flies, you would breed lines of, of fruit flies that are different colors, so you have a distinguishing population. Now, we don't do this for a lot of things, a lot of organisms anyway, because humans, you know, can't do it, it's ethical, it's logistically, but we can identify. So instead of, here, let's, let's do this. So instead of develop divergent lineages for your trait of interest, or, identify pre-existing lineages. All right, so these might be, um, let me get that in the back and we'll get back up here. So again, these might be people with heart disease and without heart disease or tall people versus short people, whatever you're looking at. Now, I've taken these from a paper. I didn't post it. I'm, that's just for my own reference down there. If you're interested, let me know and I can get it to you. It's a pretty good overview. It's not too complicated, but we're going to give you everything that you need here in this overview. So originally, we take a population of flies and maybe over 100 or so generations, we would breed it so we had specific groups representing the extremes of whatever phenotype we were interested in. And the more extreme they are, the better. So then you would do crosses with your divergent lineages. And when you cross them, you would get mixing and matching, which is what happens during meiosis, right? Because of random assortment, because of crossing over, you get mixing and matching in the, in the subpopulation. It's part from, say, uh, pigmented flies and part from no pigmented flies or very light pigment flies. And so you get this, this mix. Okay. Now, instead of crossing divergent lineages, what we can do today is we can uh, create or um, analyze, well, we'll analyze them a little bit, but obtain a large database. And big data can take the place of these uh, crossing experiments so that we don't need to do it. We can now have a much more powerful tool to do this, say, in humans. Okay. Then we determine the phenotype of the offspring and the genotype using molecular markers. So this is where the big data comes in mind. We have to have molecular markers. So we would look at fly number one here, which is a mix of its two parents. We don't know exactly, but then we look to see what genetic markers it has. And the genetic markers could help us to identify what parts of the, of the gene came, or chromosome came from parent A and what part came from parent B. Now, we can do this. Um, by sequencing 
entire genomes and looking for these particular markers. Now, the most common type of molecular marker, I put it in parentheses, or uh, quotation marks, because there are a variety of them. But the most common one is a SNP. A SNP is an acronym. It stands for Single Nucleotide Polymorphism. And basically, all a SNP is, is it's an identified polymorphism at a particular location in the genome. And you say, well, okay, great, what's a polymorphism? Well, as the name implies, poly, many, morph, meaning forms. And so polymorphism is a piece of the DNA, and this is a single one nucleotide if it's a SNP. It's a piece of DNA where part of the population has one character state, like a guanine, and the other part has a cytosine. Okay, and so we would identify all of the SNPs across the entire data set. And hopefully we'd have them fairly densely set uh, across the entire genome because if we have gaps where we don't have molecular markers, then we don't have the power to find uh, genes in that area. So these molecular markers are spread across the entire genome and they've been identified after lots of sequencing and lots of work looking for these variations. By the way, these are also what are used to help identify your ethnicity if you send in your genome uh, your DNA sample to like Ancestry.com or 23andMe or, some, or one of those companies. They sequence not your whole genome, but they sequence a whole bunch of, of areas where they know there are these SNPs or other markers that are indicative of uh, ancestry from one part of the world. And then you get a um, readout back that says, you know, 20% of your markers were identified as Eastern Europe and 5% were from uh, Middle East or whatever, and you can get your uh, estimate of where your ancestors came from. Now we can use these markers for other things also uh, other than just identifying regions of the globe where they originated. So with this large data set then we do an analysis and this is how well this is the result here this graph is the result of the analysis but this is how it works. We look for an unusual correlation between some of those markers and particular groups of people. So for instance, if the population as a whole has 50% A's at a certain position and then the other 50% of the population has G's at that position, but then I look at people with Alzheimer's disease and it's 70-30 instead of 50-50, that is a unusual uh, correlation with that site, doesn't matter if it's an A or a G, and we'll, you'll see why in a little bit, but whichever one it is, if it doesn't match the general population, that is an indicator that there is some genetic contributing factor in the neighborhood of where those markers are. And so what we do is we do a statistical analysis. The green line here re represents significantly different than the main population. And along the x-axis, we put the beginning of the chromosome, or you could do the whole genome. But this is a chromosome. Here's the beginning, the chromosome all the way to the very end. Okay. And if it is a significantly um, correlated, uh, the markers are significantly different in our population of interest, it's above the green line. If it's really above it, that's a great location. So there's something in this general area that contributes to whatever trait we're looking at. There's something here also, and it may not be as strong here because our um, correlation. And then maybe a very weak, there might be a small contributing uh, area over here. So we've identified three different regions of this chromosome that then we can look in that region, it's greatly narrowed down, and we can potentially find the genes that are contributing to this um, phenotype of interest. So we can do this with, again, any phenotype. So it's really, really powerful. You want to find out what are the genetic contributors to Alzheimer's? This is how you do it. This is how they were done, and now we know many of those. What about breast cancer, right? the BRCA1A gene or A1 or whatever it is, right? We could find those and maybe other ones that are less important that also play a role. And then we could do more follow-up studies and work to find the exact mechanisms. So this doesn't tell you the mechanism. Is it a mutated amino acid? Is it a change in the regulatory region? Is it allelic conflict? Something, we don't know. But this gives us a place to look, okay? So what do we determine from QTL studies? So as we mentioned earlier, the genetic basis for quantitative traits is very complex. The interactions of these genes is complex too, so we may even need to do a meta-analysis, right? An analysis of the output to determine if there are certain results that are 
uh, dependent on one another. And we also know that the environment can have a major effect on quantitative traits, like height, right? So height is primarily genetically determined, but there are also environmental cues. So if you're malnourished or if you're exposed to certain hormones or chemicals, you might not grow to the height, either more or less, that your genetics programmed you to. And so this is why big data sets are important because if we have a large enough data set of, of, of you know, pretty much everyone in a population, then all of that noise, that randomness can be filtered out by analyzing a large data set. Sample size makes up for a lot of, of um, issues with confounding factors like the environment. And actually one of the most highly studied data sets is uh, a genome database of every person in Iceland. I think there's something like 300,000 people that live in Iceland. And the government has collected and sequenced uh, DNA from every single citizen and made that available for researchers. It's anonymized, so they don't know who, what, who um, each individual DNA sample corresponds to, but they do know general things like, is it a male? Do they suffer from certain uh, health conditions? Do they have certain con uh, traits? And so that's a large database that was gathered uh, using tax dollars in the, uh, for Iceland. Now, obviously, there are some privacy issues here. And so that's uh, ethically, there are maybe some questions that we need to address and answer when we're working with human data. And is it OK to, to generally disperse it, even if it is anonymized? And that's not a question for, for, for knowing how it's done, but just other things to think about. So we're going to look at one example that I've taken from Shapiro et al. 2004. Again, I can give you this reference if you would like, um, but we're going to go through everything you need to know here. And it was identifying genes that play a role in this really interesting group of fish called the sticklebacks. And they were chosen because they're hyper diverse. There are many, many species and they seem to have diversified rapidly and fairly recently as new lakes and new streams were formed. So we have two types here. We have what is called the benthic type, which occurs a lot of times in fresh water and has these little tiny spurs here on the back. That's the main feature we're going to be looking at. So this has been stained, so bone is red, uh, and you can see those spurs fairly clearly. Here, notice that they have much larger spurs. Now this is a defense mechanism. And in the ocean, there are lots of predators, but when they get into freshwater streams, often they have, see a great reduction in their exposure to, to predation. And so often, then there are mutations that are selected for to reduce the size of these spines. But in the ocean, they're maintained by natural selection. And so people were interested in trying to figure, now notice there are also bony plates. And so there's some other things in addition, but we're focusing on these uh, spines. So, People wanted to know what genes cause those spines, and this is a good model system for understanding. And much of the early work in QTLs, where we're breeding divergent lines and then doing big data sets, that was done with these closely related species that we could make hybrids of. Okay, so step number one, we locate the QTL. So we do all that analysis we talked about. We already have the divergent lines here. We breed them together and we notice, we mark phenotype, and then we look at all the genetic markers, and then we look for correlations. Now, they identify 10 different uh, significant, they call them linkage groups, these significantly elevated areas. One of them was incredibly significant. So if you look at the score here, it doesn't matter the, the um, units here, but notice it's at 80 here. These others are at like four and five and eight, you know, six. So th these are significant, these four, but this one was just off the charts, right? So it was really good, and they were looking at um, uh, several different uh, ways to measure the spines that they are here. They're looking at the ascending branch of the spine, the pelvic girdle, so just different components of the spine that, that would have different shapes that they would measure. And so this is a diagram showing how they measured that. And so they identified right at the, at the, the point right here in the position of the chromosome, there is a gene that was just kind of like the um, uh, smoking gun, that's the phrase I was looking for, right? That's really an important gene because it's so, you see this massive spike in the association with that gene. And then they identified two others. And this one, they didn't have any really good candidates. There's probably something there, but there were too many genes and none of them kind of jumped out as a gene that might be important for that. So they might need to do some more work to, to um, uh, determine
uh, the gene there. But we have three genes for sure. Now notice two of them have the same name. They're actually paralogous copies of a gene called PIT-X. So PIT-X1 and PIT-X2. And the other one which is interesting is TBX4. And you might think, wait a second, I think I've seen that before, and you have. TBX4 is one of the genes that is involved in development of the vertebrate um, limbs. The forelimbs uh, and the hind limbs are controlled by these, in part by these TBX genes. So interesting thing. So let's look at PIDX1 and PIDX2, right? So we've got these candidate genes now that we've found, right? And it turns out that the homologue of PIDX1 in mice shows some very interesting mutational effects. If we have a double knockout, we basically have a mouse with non-functional hind legs, right? So it's, it's not a, as, as a severe uh, homeotic mutation as we talked about in some of the fruit flies, but still it's enough and, and plays this interesting role with the appendages in the posterior area. And these spines are kind of right in that area where we would expect the pelvic girdle to be, although fish don't have a pelvic girdle, right? So they've lost their hind limbs, okay? but interesting. So, so that's kind of jumped right out at them. And so, oh, here's a gene that not only controls appendage development in other vertebrates, but it still may play a role in some fish, but no longer growing appendages, but now growing spines. So pit X1 has been co-opted for spines in these stickleback fish. And then what they did was they did alignments and they actually looked for coding regions, coding differences to determine if they could find the exact changes that led to this reduction, this loss of, of the um, spines. And what they found was that the pit X genes for wild type, the ocean, and benthic species were identical. So there was no corresponding significant amino acid difference uh, between the ocean ones and the um, uh, benthic ones, the ones in the fresh water. And so that led them to, to think that it's not a mutation to the PIDX1 gene, but it's almost certainly a mutation to the regulatory region of uh, that gene, right? Then they started looking at this gene and looking at expression levels to see if, if when they actually looked in developing embryos, if it matched up, and sure enough, it did. The marine species had these large expression areas right where the spines were going to grow. So here, everything in the left-hand column, two columns here, is um, the marine species. And sure enough, PIDX1 is expressed in uh, fairly high amounts in the developing spines. In the other ones, they only get you know almost no expression at all in those areas. And so spines really don't develop. Okay, So now we know we've got good corroborating evidence. We've identified a gene. We've gone back in and uh, corroborated that, yep, sure enough, it, it is expressed in the right area in the right patterns. So we now have um, completed the analysis for that one gene, right? Now, in the mouse mutant, they actually change the gene itself. And when they do that, they don't get legs growing. But it turns out, as is the case for many of these developmental genes, PIDX1 is not only develop, involved in appendage development, but it also plays another of very important roles, development of the olfactory, the brain, um, and the thymus. So it plays critical roles. And if we mutated it, not only would we, do we lose our limbs, but we also have other fairly severe uh, phenotypes. And so they were able to identify the mutation to, uh, in the stickleback fish, is a mutation just to the regulatory element, so that even though the genes are there and are signaling to express this gene to build spines, this version in the freshwater ones cannot build spines because that signal is not received. There's no regulatory element there anymore. And so this just reinforces this idea that regulatory evolution is the primary mechanism for major differences between species. And even though we can't completely discount changes to the amino acid, evolution of form and diversity is much more about the evolution of regulatory elements rather than the changes in regulation of the gene. And in the next uh, discussion, we're going to look at, um, at that and we'll look at regulatory elements in a lot more detail. Now, as people have done these QTL studies on model organisms, they realize that there's lots and lots of variation that often we don't see. Um, and so depending on genetic background, mutations can have different severities of effect. So sometimes Hox genes have this massive effect, but other times it's just a small amount.
then this reinforces this idea of, okay, there's lots of genetic diversity there in many different genes, maybe with multiple alleles, maybe with epistatic interactions or codominance or all of these complex things that make up um, the genetic background of organisms. And so for many genes, there's tons and tons of variation that we often can't see just by looking at a small subset of the population. And maybe even at a large subset, we get a, only a small idea about the amount of genetic variability there. And so QTL studies and other genetic uh, studies, genome sequencing and, and annotation uh, and mapping, all of those things allow us to begin to understand the level of complexity at the genetic level. And what we found is is incredibly complex, and we are only beginning to understand all of the mechanisms and all of the diversity that go into creating diversity in populations and making differences between organisms. But we have some really nice, clear-cut, simple examples like this stickleback fish one. So look at this example of the fish. Make sure you understand the QTL study and review it a couple times if you're still a little bit uncertain. Now. The last thing, this is kind of our take home message for our species and variation discussion. Number one, genetic architecture of traits affects the types and frequency of natural variation. So what I mean by genetic architecture is, is it one gene with two alleles? Or is it many different genes? Are those genes polygenic? Are there epistatic interactions? Are there environmental influences? So all of this plays a role in the type of variability that we can see in populations. And under the right conditions, very similar changes, like in the jaguar and the jaguarundi, can cause independent but uh, seemingly um, identical, but we know now they're convergent, uh, morphology shifts. And then finally, basically, the exact same mechanisms that make differences between species also make the differences within a single population. So if you look at the person next to you, it might be, you know, 50 to 60% you have different alleles, that's why you're different. But it might also be that you just have different regulatory regions, even though you may have the same allele. So for instance, if you are O blood type, um, but expression of that O blood type is controlled by other, other um, elements, these regulatory elements, that might have an impact overall on your phenotype, much more so than the alleles themselves.